courtroom I is now live and in session. You guys can begin. I will note all loss in the chat. All right. Uh, my name is Kate Hainer Slattery, and I'll be your presiding judge today. Uh, before we get started scoring judges, make sure you're muted and have your video off. Make sure you stay in that mode unless the video tells you otherwise. Uh, you should also have your video set to hide all non-video participants. So the only people you should see right now on the screen are me and the advocates. Can we start with appearances from the attorneys? Uh, appearances for the plaintiff, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor, and members of the jury. My name is Mason Baruki, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Jacob Hayward. Good morning, Your Honor, or afternoon. We represent the plaintiff in today's case, Mr. Stevie Rogers. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Introductions from the defense as well, Your Honor. You may. Good afternoon. My name is Sonali Mehta. I'm joined today by my co-counsel, Mr. Stephen Becker. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And together, we represent the defendant in today's case, Ms. Drew Mars. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Afternoon. Do we have any further pretrial matters? Uh, just a few from the plaintiff, Your Honor. Uh, first, at this time, the plaintiff would like to introduce rule or evoke Rule 603. This is the constructive pre-swearing in of all witnesses. No objection, Your Honor. Any objection from the defense? None. All right, so invoked. Uh, the plaintiff would also like to invoke Rule 615. This calls for the constructive sequestration of all witnesses barring party representatives. And in today's case, the plaintiff's party representative is Mr. Stevie Rogers. All right. Defense? Yes, Your Honor. Our party representative is, of course, the defendant, Drew Mars. As we stipulated to, we have no objection to inv invoking Rule 615. All right. The other two witnesses are sequestered. And lastly, the plaintiff would like to direct the court's attention to evidentiary ruling 17. Uh, evidentiary ruling 17 says that exhibits one through seven have already been pre-admitted into evidence and may be used at any point throughout trial. All right, is that? That is our understanding as well, Your Honor. I'm not sure if it's just my connection, but I am having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I think your video is cutting out from time to time. All right. Um, I'll look around if I can get a microphone that'll make it a bit easier, but let me know if I cut out too much. Are you hearing me okay right now? Yes. And your honor, right. uh, defense is ready for trial as well. Okay, we can now hear opening statements from each party. Everyone should make sure you are in speaker view for this, and please make sure your audio is off when the other attorney is speaking. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, opposing counsel, members of the jury, may it please the court. On August 15th, 2018, beloved mystery novelist Agatha Lee died in her sleep. Now, the death of an 82-year-old woman while she sleeps doesn't usually raise many questions. But the death of Agatha Lee was far from usual. As soon as he heard she was dead, her grandson, Stevie Rogers, knew something was wrong. How could his lively, loving grandmother be gone just like that? Turns out Agatha's death was part of a plot worthy of her own writing. You see, just the previous day, Agatha had announced that she would change her will. And she made an appointment to amend the will and leave her entire estate to her grandson, Stevie. If she had lived just two more days, her entire inheritance would be changed. It would go to Stevie and not Drew Mars, her caretaker, who she had currently listed as a beneficiary. Now, all the elements of a great story are there. A reclusive millionaire, a contested inheritance, and as you'll hear today, a clear villain in the defendant, Drew Mars. Investigation into Agatha's death revealed that she had been poisoned, 
her medication swapped with the drug chlorandramine, a drug that identical to her medication was far different in effect. See, Agatha had a deathly allergy to chlorandramine, one that Miss Mars was fully aware of. Now, in the days that followed her death, the police searched her house and spoke with those close to her and conducted a thorough investigation, all while Miss Mars prepared to inherit the $24 million estate of Agatha Lee. But what Drew Mars didn't realize was that in Midlands, crime doesn't pay and villains don't win. Under the law, no one can inherit any part of his estate if they are responsible for the death of the decedent. Now this doesn't have to come from a criminal conviction for murder. A civil proceeding can determine whether or not that beneficiary was responsible. And that's why we're here today. You see, has the plaintiff in today's proceeding, we have a burden. We have to prove to you, not by a reasonable doubt as in a criminal proceeding, but simply by a preponderance of the evidence that Drew Mars purposely or knowingly caused the death of Agatha Lee. Essentially, we just have to show it's more likely than not that Drew Mars is the one responsible for Agatha's death. And today we will meet that burden by calling before you witnesses who will reveal the physical evidence and their observations that show how Drew Mars made herself the villain in Agatha Lee's story. First, you're going to hear from Madison Bond, a distinguished private investigator who worked tirelessly on this case alongside the police. She'll detail how she found evidence that directly connected Miss Mars to the pills used to kill Agatha. Not only that, she'll tell you about her personal observations and interactions with the defendant in the days after Agatha's death, and she'll tell you how the police and her both came to the same conclusion that Drew Mars had killed Agatha Lee. After Miss Bond, you'll hear from Stevie Rogers, Agatha's only living family, and he will tell you how happy he was to be back with his grandmother and how happy she was to have him back. You see, they drifted apart, but upon this re reunion, she was so moved that she decided to leave him her entire estate. Now, that touching moment of reconciliation was overshadowed by the eavesdropping defendant, Drew Mars, who made a point to tell Stevie Rogers two words as he left the room, no way. She was determined to prevent him from inheriting a single cent. Now, in life, Agatha created a mystery that is loved by people everywhere and is sold internationally. Her death, though, leaves a much simpler story. One of a family reunion cut short by an act of greed. But the ending is not yet written. It is up to you, members of the jury, to ensure that Agatha's final wishes are acted upon, to ensure that Drew Mars does not profit from her misdeed, and to ensure that the villain in Agatha Lee's story cannot win. It is up to you. That's why at the conclusion of today's trial, my co-counsel Mason Baruki will come before you and ask you to rule in favor of the plaintiff. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Open from the defense. Yes, your honor. May it please the court. She was set up to be taken down. Now the plaintiff just came up here and they told you that in 2018, Drew Mars was working as the caretaker and nurse for Agatha Lee. That's true. They told you that Agatha Lee died later that year after she had a fatal allergic reaction to a medicine. That's true too. But members of the jury, they told you that Agatha Lee died because of Drew Mars. 
that Miss Mars is the clear villain. That's not true. See, I wanna start by taking a second to introduce you to the person who the plaintiff called a villain, a woman named Drew Mars. See, for the past 10 years of her life, Miss Mars worked for Agatha Lee, making sure she had everything she wanted or needed. The two were so close, they were almost like family. And Agatha Lee decided she wanted to leave her estate to Drew Mars when she died. But you're gonna learn that all of that changed in 2018, when Agatha's grandson, a man named Stevie Rogers came to visit. You see, Stevie Rogers hadn't been in communication with his grandmother for almost a decade. But in 2018, his trust fund ran out. He was broke. So he showed up on his grandmother's doorstep, begging to be put back in the will. One month later, Agatha Lee was dead. And Stevie Rogers was framing Drew Mars for the killing. You see, members of the jury, that's why we're here today. Stevie Rogers has brought this lawsuit under Midland's Slayer statute so that he can take Agatha's money for himself, even though he wasn't in her will. To do that, he has to prove to you that it is more likely than not that Drew Mars intentionally killed Agatha Lee. The plaintiff isn't going to be able to meet that burden today. And to help you understand why, I want you to keep these three things in mind throughout today's trial. First, the plaintiff doesn't have any hard evidence suggesting that Drew Mars did what they say she did. Second, Drew Mars had no motive to kill. And third, Stevie Rogers framed Drew Mars. I want to take those one at a time, starting with that first thing. The plaintiff doesn't have any hard evidence. You see, members of the jury, Mr. Hayward just came up here and he told you a very specific story. The plaintiff believes that Drew Mars purchased chloroandramine, switched Agatha Lee's pills, which killed her. But you're not going to hear from a witness today who's going to tell you about any of that. And not a single witness who saw Drew Mars purchasing chloroandramine not a receipt to prove that she did. Not anyone who can tell you that Drew Mars switched the pills at all. Next, you'll learn that Drew Mars had no motive to kill Agatha Lee. You see, the plaintiff wants you to believe that Drew Mars had a motive because she believed she was going to be taken out of Agatha's will. But members of the jury, Drew Mars is gonna testify today. She'll tell you exactly what she heard the day before Agatha died. She'll tell you she heard Stevie Rogers asking to be put back in that will. But Agatha said no. And you don't just have to take Miss Mars's word for it, because you're also going to hear from Miss Ryan Cabrera, one of Agatha's closest friends, who she spoke with later on that same day. Miss Cabrera will tell you exactly what Agatha Lee told her. Stevie asked her for something. She had to say no. So finally, we're going to show you exactly what Stevie Rogers did when he realized he was never getting back into his grandmother's will. We're going to show you how he set up Drew Mars. See, Stevie Rogers knew that Agatha was allergic to chloroandrine. He had access to her pills the day before she died. You're going to learn that Stevie Rogers knew if he could pin this whole thing on Drew Mars, then he would get all of Agatha's money instead of Miss Mars. So from the minute that Agatha Lee's body was found, Stevie started accusing Drew of murder. You're gonna hear that he filed this lawsuit, accusing Drew Mars of poisoning his grandmother with chloroandramine before he had seen a toxicology report, an autopsy or an official cause of death. See, members of the jury, over the course of today's trial, the plaintiff is going to tell you to ignore the evidence that points to Stevie Rogers. They're going to tell you that Drew Mars, well, she's a villain. She deserves to be taken down. But members of the jury, I want you to remember that underneath all those accusations, 
there's a human being. A woman who spent the past 10 years of her life making sure that Agatha Lee was happy and healthy. A woman who woke up one morning to find that the closest thing she had to family was gone. A woman who was set up to be taken down. At the end of today's trial, we're going to ask you to see through that setup. We're going to ask you to find Drew Mars not liable. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. As all scoring judges, make sure you switch into gallery view. And then plaintiff, you can call your first witness. Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the plaintiff calls Madison Bond to the stand. May I proceed? You may. Can you please introduce yourself to the court? Hello, my name is Madison Bond and I'm a private investigator in the state of Midland. And are you currently licensed as a private investigator? Yes, not only am I licensed, but I'm also renowned here in the area of Midlands for my work. Well, what kind of cases do you work? I've worked in some high profile cases like the TBD embezzlement case a few years back, or you might be more familiar with my work last year, saving that missing girl with brittle bone disease. Those are the sensational cases, however, and my day-to-day -day work usually focuses on investigating adultery or family reunification cases to help people reconnect with lost family members. And how did you come to be involved with Miss Agatha Lee? Agatha Lee's grandson, Stevie, reached out to me in early 2018 because he wanted to reconnect with his grandmother who he lost touch with. After some intensive detective work on my part, I was actually able to reunite the pair in June. And to be clear, is that the same Agatha Lee who is in question today? Yes, unfortunately, she passed away around August 14th. Were you involved in any investigation into her death? Uh, yeah, Stevie actually reached out to me because of my prior work with the Lee family. I arrived at the scene around the same time as the police and they gave me permission to work alongside their investigation. So I set out to find the truth in today's case. When you started your investigation, were there any persons of interest? According to witnesses in the police report, there were three people in the house that night. Agatha Lee, Stevie Rogers, who was her grandson, and Drew Mars, her caretaker. So therefore those were the suspects of the case. Ms. Bond, how can you be certain those were the only suspects? Well, not only were they the only people known to be in the house, but they were also reportedly the only three people that knew of her fatal choroandromine allergy. Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. Bond's counsel? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If I may, per the orders uh, evidentiary orders that have been given to your honor prior to today's hearing, specifically ruling number 17. Exhibits one through seven are pre-admitted and may be used for any purpose at any time during trial. And under section 22, to aid the jury in understanding the evidence, Bond may testify to the contents of exhibit six. Now this information is within the police report, which has been marked and pre-admitted has exhibit six. and. Ms. Bond thus has the foundational knowledge from that document. May I respond, Your Honor? Okay. Now, it's true that Ms. Bond is familiar with the document, and, and we do agree that she's allowed to testify to it, but that doesn't mean that she can do so without foundation. If it is, in fact, true that this information she just testified comes from the police report, then she has a foundational requirement to testify to that. I do remember her mentioning the police report a minute ago, so I'll overrule the objection. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Uh, Bond, to resume, why was that allergy relevant? Well, because those people were the only three people that knew of that allergy, and that was actually how she died. She ingested coroandramine, causing an allergic reaction that ultimately killed Agatha Lee. Now, at the start of your investigation, when you arrived at the house, what did you do first? Well, first I went and I spoke to her grandson, Stevie Rogers, who informed me of his concerns that Drew Mars may have murdered his grandmother. 
what did you do next? I decided to follow up on his concerns by assessing the scene in its entirety and seeing what evidence was available. And what did you find at the scene? Initially, everything pointed to an old woman dying of natural causes. The body was undisturbed, she looked uninjured, and the only thing of interest was an inconspicuous pill organizer set open on the nightstand. Would you recognize a picture of that pill organizer if I were to show you one today? Uh, yes, I would. Your Honor, permission for my co-counsel to put up a depiction of Exhibit 12? You may. Now, Ms. Bond, what is this image depicting? This is a picture of that pill organizer. Is it a fair and accurate depiction? Um, I believe so, yes. And has it been changed or altered in any way? No, I don't believe so. At this time, plaintiff moves Exhibit 12 into evidence. Any objection, counsel? Could you repeat that? Apologies, we have no objections. All right, so admitted. Ms. Bond, what are we looking at here exactly? Well, this is a picture of Agatha's pill organizer. Apparently, Drew Mars would go and lay out Agatha's pills for each night of the week in here. And you can see in some of the bottles that haven't been Objection, taken. Objection, Your Honor. Once again, to lack of foundation. May I be hurt? You may. Now, we understand that previously, Ms. Bond was talking about the police report, but she just testified, apparently Drew Mars would lay out all the pills for the week in this pill organizer. She's no longer talking about the police report, and as the record stands, there's no foundation for how she would know that. Counsel? Your Honor, Ms. Bond is still referring to the police report here, as she did testify in the beginning of her testimony. She was working alongside the police to conduct her own investigation. Therefore, throughout that investigation, she was regularly relying on the same information that was made available to the police. Therefore, many of her conclusions in today's case are drawn heavily from the information recovered by the police at the scene, and therefore she will testify to that to the, her knowledge of it. I think in this case, you should lay a bit more foundation that she's getting this information from the police report, um, since it's important to distinguish what she knows personally here. So objection sustained for now, but feel free to lay that foundation. Yes, Your Honor. Move to strike until the foundation is laid, Your Honor. It's stricken. Ms. Bond, do you know who is responsible for Agatha's medication? Yes, based on uh, police's interviews with witnesses, uh, Agatha Lee's medications were outlined actually by Drew Mars. She would put out the pills each night for Agatha Lee to take for the corresponding days. Now, were there any other things that stood out during your initial survey of the scene? Well, besides um, what was previously mentioned, the only other thing of note was Drew Mars, the caretaker, uh, seemed rather agitated and anxious. Uh, she was very adamant. To an improper opinion, may I be heard? You may. Now, Ms. Bond just testified that the only thing of note was Drew Mars's behavior. Ms. Bond isn't a police officer. She's not a police detective. She doesn't work for the state in any capacity. She's a private investigator, and there's no foundation on the record about her qualifications to give an expert conclusion like that. At this point, it's inadmissible under 701. Counsel, do you think she can testify to the only thing of note? Uh, Your Honor, this is not expert testimony. This is actually her lay opinion. This is simply based on her rationally based perception. She is, however, licensed as a private investigator, and we did lay foundation that she has years of experience. So while this is her lay opinion, it goes to her investigation, and she is allowed to testify to it under 701. Response, Your Honor? Anything for counsel? You may. Yes, Your Honor. Testifying that a piece of evidence is the only thing of note is far outside the scope of a lay opinion. She can't give weight to evidence. That's a job for the jury or an expert. Therefore, it's, it can't be a lay opinion or rationally based on her perception, but it's an expert conclusion. I think the jury can understand that it's her opinion and what's notable, so I'll overrule the objection. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, to resume, Ms. Bond, you were mentioning Drew Mars at the scene. What was your initial uh, impression? Well, so Drew Mars, the caretaker, seemed rather agitated and anxious. She was really adamant that Agatha get cremated as soon as possible. 
However, in order to comfort Agatha's distressed grandson, I actually recommended an autopsy be performed first. And that's how we discovered there was more to this case than meets the eye. What do you mean by that? Well, there were three things that helped me uncover the mysteries of this case. First was the announcement of Agatha's will. Second was the toxicology report from Agatha's autopsy. And finally, there was the hidden black bag discovered by the police in Drew Mar's closet. Well, let's take those one at a time, starting with the will. What did you find during the announcement of Agatha's will? Well, at the will announcement, it was um, said that Drew Mars, Agatha's caretaker, was the sole beneficiary of the will. And how did Mars react to that? They acted very surprised, like they had no idea. That would have eliminated them as a likely suspect for me. However, their surprise was actually a lie. How could you know that they were lying? Um, because of an email I discovered on Drew Mars's computer. Would you recognize a photo of that email if I showed you one today? Yes, I would. Your Honor, permission for opposing or co-counsel to put up Exhibit 13? You may. And what is this an image of, Ms. Bond? This is a copy of that email. And is it a fair and accurate copy? Uh, yes, I believe so. Has it been changed or altered in any way? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, at this time, plaintiff moves Exhibit 13 into evidence. Any objection? Without objection. All right, so admitted. What did you learn from this email, Ms. Bond? Well, you can see in the email, it writes, um, Agatha showed me a will that is dated today saying, Stevie, the no good grandkid, is out and I get everything. The house, the money, everything. We're talking millions of dollars. And this email was from February, so six months earlier. Drew was already aware of the contents in Agatha's will well before her death. This not only demonstrates that Drew Mars lied, but it also establishes a possible motive. Why Jeff, do you think Your Honor's this lack of foundation. Can you explain that a little more, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. We understand their foundation for, for talking about the lie, but that second part, it establishes a motive. There's no foundation for that. And as the record stands, it would be an improper opinion. Response? Your Honor, if I may proffer, I was actually about to ask the witness to explain the foundation on which she based that. Why don't we get that foundation first and then she can testify why she believed it was a motive? Yes, Your Honor. Move to strike. For now, yes. Uh, Ms. Bond, did you ever find any evidence of a possible motive for Drew Mars? Well, based on that email, not only would Drew inherit the estate, but over the course of my investigation and from witness testimony, I also heard that Agatha was planning on changing her will soon. Meaning- Objection, Your Honor, to hearsay. Response counsel? Your Honor, the witness has testified that this was based on her investigation, which is well-documented, has coming largely from the work of the police in Exhibit 6, which has been pre-admitted. Response, Your Honor? You may. Now, she testified throughout my investigation and from witnesses I spoke to. We're objecting to the witnesses she spoke to. We have it on a good faith basis to believe that the only foundation for this is from the word of Stevie Rogers. In this case, Your Honor, this would have to be testified to firsthand by Stevie Rogers. Counsel, do you agree that that's the only foundation for this? Your Honor, I believe the foundation has been laid that she was at the scene with police officers conducting this investigation she was there for a number of the police investigatory functions, including the speaking of witnesses, likely including Stevie Rogers. Response, Your Honor? But for this specific piece of information, do you believe that that's the only place where this piece of information came from? Uh, Your Honor, I'm not certain as to where Ms. Bond drew all of her information for her sources, but I would imagine that she has a number of sources through her investigation. Response, Your Honor? Why don't we get exactly where, she, uh, one moment, counsel, why don't we get exactly where she got that information from? And then if you believe that's hearsay, you can object to that statement itself. Yes, Your Honor, certainly. Ms. Bond, where did you uncover evidence that Agatha might have been changing her will? Uh, that was based on my conversations with witnesses, specifically, I think Stevie Rogers mentioned it during my investigation. Objection, Your Honor, to hearsay. 
All right, so what's your response to hearsay here? Your Honor, this is not being used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Rather, it's going to inform the subsequent actions of the listener and that Ms. Bond would take this information and follow up throughout an investigation. Response? Your Honor, the testimony that she gave was, I learned that Agatha Lee was planning to change her will. That's clearly being used for the truth of the matter asserted. Your Honor, if they were just using this for a subsequent action, they would have originally framed it in the terms of her statement and what she did afterward, but that's not how they framed it. Any response to that? Your Honor, I stand by the contention that this is being used to prove subsequent action in that it went to further Ms. Bond's investigation and narrow down the routes in which she would proceed with her investigation. May I respond once more, Your Honor? One more. The line of questioning that this testimony came in on was when Mr. Hayward was asking Ms. Bond about a motive that Drew Mars would have. Given the context for this, Your Honor, it's clear that they're using this for the truth of the matter asserted. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll sustain it for now. If you can talk more about her investigation, you might be able to bring this in as the explanation there, but I believe opposing counsel is right on that context. Yes, Your Honor. Move to strike the offending testimony. It's stricken. Ms. Bond, you mentioned there were three things in your investigation. Besides the will, what else was there? Well, the toxicology report came back from the coroner's office, and Agatha's death was in fact not from natural causes. Agatha had a large amount of the drug coroandramide in her system, provoking a lethal allergic reaction. Do you know anything else about chloroandramine that you can tell us? Yes, it's an over-the-counter drug for heartburn, but it looks exactly like Agatha's arthritis medication. Was any chloroandramine found at Lee Manor following Agatha's death? So there was a bottle of it found um, on the scene, which brings me to the last significant clue. The black bag containing coroandermine discovered by the police in Drew Mars's closet. Well, what exactly were the contents of this black bag you mentioned? The bag contained some cigarettes in that bottle of coroandermine. Was there any physical evidence recovered from that bag? There were finger smudges on the medication bottle, but no usable prints. There was, however, a usable print on the zipper itself, and that fingerprint belonged to Drew Mars. Now, would you recognize a photo of that bottle of chloroandramine if I were to show it to you today? Uh, yes, I would. Permission for my co-counsel to put up Exhibit 17? You may. And what is this an image depicting, Ms. Bond? So this is a picture of that bottle of chloroandramine. And is it a fair and accurate depiction? Uh, yes, I believe so. Has it been changed or altered in any way? Not to my knowledge. At this time, the plaintiff moves Exhibit 17 into evidence. Any objection? No objections. All right, it's admitted. Now, what stood out to you about these pills, Ms. Bond? Well, again, the coroandermine pills look the exact same as the two arthritis pills that Agatha took every night. And per the results of her autopsy, that is what ultimately caused her death that night. Was there anything else of note in that autopsy report? In the autopsy report, not only did Agatha have coroandermine in her system, but we discovered she also had only trace amounts of her arthritis medication in her system from that night, showing that she didn't ingest her arthritis medication, but instead there was coroandermine there in its place. Did you find anything in your investigation that might have helped explain that? Well, there were also fingerprints found belonging to Drew Mars on two of the arthritis pills in Agatha's pill bottle. Why did that stand out to you? Well, you'd expect to find prints on the pills in the organizer, but not the ones in the bottle. It suggests that the pills may have been taken from the organizer and placed back into the bottle, which- Objection, Your Honor, to speculation. Response. Your Honor, this is not speculative. As the witness has made clear, this is a possibility that was explored through her investigation. She's not declaring this to be what happened because that would be speculation without her knowledge, but this is simply her perception based on her investigation. Response counsel? Your Honor, by saying that this is a possibility or that this is something she considered, she is testifying to a definitive fact that this is a possibility. And there's no foundation for her to do that. She doesn't have a, a personal knowledge about what happened with the pills that were found in that pill bottle. Anything further, counsel? You may. 
Uh, Your Honor, there is foundation for this and that this is her rationally based perception based on what she observed throughout her investigation and what she has testified to today. The fingerprints, the chlorandramine that was filled, the autopsy report, all of these informed her to form a rationally based perception of this possibility. I'll overrule it as long as she keeps her testimony to what the possibilities are and not asserts anything about what actually happened. Yes, Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Bond, can you repeat why exactly those stood out to you? Of course. So um, you'd expect to find prints again on the pills in the organizer, but not the ones in the bottle. So perhaps it's a possibility that the pills may have been taken from the organizer and placed back into the bottle, which could explain why she didn't have her arthritis medication in her system and instead had chloroandramide in her system that night. Ms. Bond, at the conclusion of the police investigation, do you know what their conclusion was? Uh, Well, the detectives came to all the same conclusions that I did, and um, she actually arrested Drew Mars for the murder of Agatha Lee. Thank you. No further questions. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon, Ms. Bond. I'm gonna be asking you some more questions today. Before I start, can you see and hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, I wanna begin by talking about how you first got involved in today's case. I'm sorry, but on August 15th, Stevie Rogers called you, correct? Um, In this case, yes. He called you up uh, on the morning, about 10 minutes after Agatha Lee had been found dead. Uh, That's what I surmised from the detective's report. But man, when Stevie Rogers called you up that morning, he didn't say my grandma is dead and something seems off, did he? No, he seemed pretty concerned that something may have happened to Agatha Lee that was um, similar to murder rather than some accident. You say uh, something similar to murder. To be clear, what Stevie Rogers said on that phone call was my Nana was murdered, right? Yes, he seemed very concerned at the time. Ma'am, at this point, no toxicology screen had been done. You're correct. We had, I had no evidence at that time. No autopsy had been conducted? No, sir. But when Stevie Rogers called you up that morning, he told you confidently that this was a homicide. Isn't that true? Yes, he seemed very alarmed. So let's talk about what happened when you arrived at the house and whether that kind of behavior continued. Okay. Now, when you got there, Stevie Rogers was talking a lot about Drew Mars, right? Yes, he mentioned Drew Mars as a possible suspect. In fact, he was worried that she had actually killed his grandmother. Well, ma'am, he didn't just mention Drew Mars as a possible suspect. He was insisting that Drew Mars had murdered Agatha Lee. Isn't that true? Pardon me. I found Drew Mars to be a possible suspect as one of the three people in the house. But Stevie was adamant that he was concerned that Drew Mars committed a murder. Now, ma'am, looking at Miss Lee's body, you couldn't tell that she had been poisoned, could you? Exactly. Like I said earlier, it was actually, um, it looked relatively mundane, the scene. It seemed like an old woman may have just passed in her sleep. It was only based on other evidence that we found in the case where it actually was surmised that it was possibly a murder. That's exactly right, ma'am. It was based on evidence that hadn't come in yet, right? That's true. At that time, we had no evidence that um, pointed in that direction. In addition to you thinking that the police detective who was there she also didn't see any reason to suspect foul play. Isn't that true? Objection, yes. Your Honor. Speculation. Your Honor, may I respond? Response counsel? Your Honor, this is based on the police report. She testified at length on direct examination about what the detective found, what the detective thought of things. It's perfectly within her knowledge. Your Honor, if I may. You may. The police report may make note of the scene and of initial impressions, but it does not go into length about the specific detective's regards for the case in terms of the scene of what might have happened. Since it's cross-examination, she's free to say if she doesn't know from the police report, but right now I'll allow it. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Bond, it's actually true that in her police report, that detective specifically said that she had no reason to suspect foul play, right? Initially, upon entering the scene, you're correct. It seemed mundane, and so the detective didn't see anything of note. But then we want to go and actually evaluate the evidence in its entirety. So we wanted to wait until we concluded, based on all the evidence available to us, what actually happened. 
and I understand that, but I'm, I'm talking about what happened when you arrived at the scene. Neither yes, you nor that detective you. suspected foul play, correct? Yes, initially there was no suspected foul play. But on the other hand, Stevie Rogers, well, he was adamant that you needed to test Miss Lee's blood for poison, right? Um, Stevie Rogers was adamant that we do an autopsy. And so that's what I recommended just to provide him some comfort. And it's actually how we discovered there was much more to this case. Well, actually he was specifically adamant that you needed to do a, a toxicology screen, right? Um, I believe so. And that's the, something that's not usually done when you find an 82 year old woman who dies in her sleep, correct? Not typically, depending on the evidence that's available though and the witnesses that are around and how they're behaving. It can be worthwhile, especially when there's um, this much money on the line and it's so unconventional in terms of the will reading that it seemed worthwhile to go and just check all our boxes. Ma'am, in addition to demanding a toxicology screen, Stevie Rogers also demanded that you take pictures of the pill organizer next to Miss Lee's bed. Isn't that true? Yes, he did. Now, after these interactions with Stevie Rogers, you continued with the rest of your investigation, like you testified to, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about what you did and didn't find during that investigation. Okay. Now, Ms. Bond, you understand that the plaintiff is claiming today that Drew Mars swapped Agatha Lee's pills with chloroandrum, right? Yes. But no one you spoke to ever claimed to have seen Drew Mars swapping anything, did they? No one has claimed that, but that being said, we did find the murder weapon in today's case in Drew Mars's closet. We did find that she was acting suspicious upon the scene. She wanted to go and have the body cremated immediately. There were some suspicious signs along the way that actually pointed us in that direction. Ms. Bond, I'm not asking you about what you did find. I'm asking about what you didn't find. Okay. Not a single person told you they saw Drew Mars purchasing chloroandrum either, did they? You're correct. You but um, I that, that. did make a trip to CVS the day before the murder, which also was something that was a suspect. Ma'am, redirecting you to my question, not a single person claims to have seen her buying chloroandramine, yes or no? No one has said that they have seen her buying that product. I just know that she was at a drugstore on the day before the murder. Now, Ms. Bond, you also testified to a bag you found in Drew Mars's closet and a fingerprint you found on. I, actually did not. I didn't find that bag, sir. The police did. But um, yes, continue. No one you spoke to ever claimed to have seen Drew Mars put anything in that bag, did they? Uh, no one told me that they had seen Drew Mars interacting with that bag. But you mentioned that fingerprint. That fingerprint was only on the outside of the bag, correct? Yes, it was on the zipper of the bag, actually. You didn't find any fingerprints belonging to Drew Mars inside that bag? No, there were finger smudges, so it suggests that someone was interacting with it, but we weren't able to actually get a full print. And what I want to be very clear about here, ma'am, is that on the bottle of chloroandramine itself, you did not find a single fingerprint belonging to Drew Mars, yes or no? No, we weren't able to find any prints, actually. They were just smudges. But in the end, you did settle on Drew Mars, correct? Well, based on all the evidence, I think it was... Um, really convincing for the fact that Drew Mars had a part to play in this murder investigation. That's a yes, you settled on Drew Mars? I didn't settle on Drew Mars, but based on the evidence, it pointed to Drew Mars as the culprit. Well, when you came to that conclusion, you actually gave some reasons for it, right? Well, based on the evidence, I broke down the three things that really drove me to go and find out the secrets in today's case. I want to talk about the evidence you found, the, the reasons you gave, and whether they actually point to Drew Mars. Now, okay. one of the reasons you settled on Drew Mars was because she knew about Miss Lee's chloroandramine allergy, correct? Yes, but like I said, all three people in the house knew of the chloroandramine allergy, so that wasn't a really big pull factor. They just made them all three suspects for this murder. Well, that's exactly right, ma'am. Stevie Rogers also knew about that allergy. Uh, yes, to my knowledge, he did. he was aware of it. One of the reasons you gave for settling on Drew Mars was because that bag you mentioned was found in her closet, correct? Yes, it was. But you know that there were no locks on Drew Mars's door, were there? I don't believe so, to my knowledge. But the partial print that was found on said bag was actually very compelling evidence. And the fact that I'm Drew Mars- I'm asking you about a fingerprint. I'm asking you if there are locks on Drew Mars's door, and the answer is no. 
No, I don't believe so. You know that if someone had wanted to plant that bag in Drew Mars's room, well, they physically could have accessed that closet, right? I guess so. You settled on Drew Mars partially because she had access to Miss Lee's uh, pill organizer. Isn't that true? Uh, Drew Mars actually was the one who laid out um, Agatha's pills each week. Well, once again, ma'am, in your own words, Stevie Rogers also had access to that pill organizer. I guess you could say so, but he didn't have close acts. He didn't have close contact with those pills on a regular basis. Well, ma'am, you say, I, you guess I could say so. You actually said so, didn't you? Yes, he didn't have like immediate contact with it, but he did have access to it in the house. Again, I considered him as a suspect as I considered all three individuals. Ms. Bond, one of the reasons you settled on Drew Mars as a suspect was because she had access to the pill that killed Agatha Lee, chloroandrin. Well, she had um, gone to the pharmacy the day before, which was something that was suspect to me. And you understand that chloroandrine, it's an over-the-counter medication? Yes, I do. And you know that if Stevie Rogers had wanted to get his hands on some chloroandrine, he could have picked it up at any pharmacy. Yes, you're right. Anyone could have. But again, all of these things were not the only evidence that led me to come to my conclusions today. Those are not the only reasons that I actually decided on Drew Mars. In fact, none of those were really anything that was significant evidence for me in deciding what may have happened here today. Your Honor, at this point, I would move to strike as non-responsive. Your Honor, if I may. I'll allow it, but I'll allow it for now, um, but keep your answers a little shorter. Uh, just make sure you're answering the questions. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Bond, you can see some similarities here between Drew Mars and Stevie Rogers. I want to talk about one major difference between them. Okay. Now, both Stevie Rogers and Drew Mars were in the house on the night that Miss Lee died, like you testified, right? Yes, sir. And like you testified, you considered both of them as suspects. Yes, sir. But Ms. Bond, out of those two suspects you had, only one of them offered to pay you, right? Well, I get money to start looking at a case. It doesn't determine anything I do afterwards. So I guess Stevie Rogers is who pointed me to this mystery, but it's not the person who determined anything I did during it. Ma'am, Stevie Rogers is the one that hired you, right? Yes, he hired me to look into the case. Stevie Rogers is the one who offered to pay you $25,000 for your investigation, right? Yes, that is my standard rate here in Midlands. Ma'am, at the time you made your conclusion, Stevie Rogers actually still owed you that $25,000. Isn't that true? Maybe. I have my secretary, Bobby Lynn, handle most of my finances, but that might be correct. Ma'am, yes or no? At the time you made your conclusion, she hadn't paid you. You actually know that for a fact, don't you? I guess C.V. Rogers hasn't paid me yet. It hasn't been a big concern. I've kind of made a lot of money over the course of my career through the cases I've worked. And so I do a lot of my work pro bono or I don't really keep track of how my finances are at this point. Ms. Mento, you can take the chart down. Let's be very clear, Ms. Paul. At the conclusion of your investigation, the person you settled on, the person you concluded was responsible for this crime was the one who had it offered to pay you $25,000. Yes or no? The person who the evidence pointed to, yes, was Drew Mars. Your Honor, I have nothing further. Any redirect, counsel? Briefly, Your Honor. Ms. Bond, was the pills that killed Agatha Lee recovered? Yes, uh, they were. They were found in Drew Mars's closet. And where were they in Drew Mars's closet? In a black bag sitting on the floor. And whose fingerprints were on that black bag? Drew Mars's fingerprints. Did you find Stevie Rogers' fingerprints anywhere near that bag? No, sir. Did you find Stevie Rogers' fingerprints on any of Miss Lee's other medication? No, we did not. It was only Drew Mars's fingerprints. No further questions. Any recall? All right. You're the witness is excused. Does the plaintiff want to call their next witness? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the plaintiff calls Mr. Stevie Rogers to the stand.
Now, may I proceed? You may. Uh, good afternoon. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Well, hi, I'm Stevie Rogers. And why are you in court here today? It's pretty simple. I just want justice for my grandmother. Who is your grandmother? Agatha Lee, the famous author. Most of you all probably read her book, Death in a Bottle, at some point in a high school English class. It's still taught across the country today. Now, were you and Miss Agatha Lee close? We were. We fell out of touch for a little while, but eventually we reunited after years apart. We were actually living together when, when she passed. Now, did you always live with your grandmother? Not always. Um, I moved in in July 2018, and it was the closest thing to home that I'd felt in a while. What do you mean by that? For the first 20 years of my life, I lived in a caring, loving home. And I had two brilliant and, and kind parents who, who dedicated their lives to family. But, but, but that all changed in, in 2008. Well, what happened in 2008? My parents were killed. A drunk driver crashed into our car on the way home from a 4th of July cooking cookout. It was just a few days before my 21st birthday. Well, were you hurt in that car accident? Not physically, really. Um, I had a few bruises, but I, I mean, emotionally, I was crushed. I'm really sorry to hear that, Mr. Rogers. Uh, what did you do after your parents passed away? My parents left me some money, so... I used it to numb the pain of losing them. I traveled, I drank, I, I even tried law school for a little while. I did anything to, to keep my mind occupied. And what was your relationship like with your grandmother during this time? We didn't talk much. It was just too hard. I thought of my Nana and instantly my mind would, would go to my dead mom. Could you tell us a little bit about what your life looked like during this point in time? It was tough. Um, eventually, in the beginning of 2017, I checked myself into a residential treatment clinic, rehab. It was a 60-day plan that included therapy on dealing with my parents' death. Was this rehab successful for you? It was the best decision I, I could have made. I was able to confront the feelings I had about my past. Part of the therapy actually did involve thinking critically about the relationships that I had left. And it made me really think about trying to reconnect with my grandmother. And how did you ever get around to reconnecting with your grandmother? I did. Aside from a few letters, we hadn't communicated for a while. And the last address I had was the old family home in Monroeville, Alabama but she had apparently moved away some time back. If she moved away, how, how were you able to get in touch with her if you didn't know where she lived? I hired an investigator to find her. Um, I, I gave her all the letters Nana sent me over the years and, and a few photo, photos of us together. Uh, apparently, the investigator was able to find that she was living in Midlands now. Did you ever go and visit her? I did. I showed up on Nana's door exactly 10 years after my parents' accident. I burst into tears right when I saw her. And how did your grandmother react to you showing up at her door? Like she always had, with open arms. At the time that you moved back in with your grandmother, uh, was she living alone? No, actually, she was living with her housekeeper, Drew Mars. No. You said your grandmother was living with her housekeeper. Uh, were you familiar with what her job entailed? I was. Um, Mars kept the house tidy. She would drive Nana to her appointments, and, and Mars was in charge of Nana's medications. Uh, what medications, Mr. Rogers? I, I really couldn't tell you. Nana was always so proud and, 
didn't like discussing the medicines she took more than she had to. Objection, Your Honor, speculation. What specifically do you think is speculation? Yes, Your Honor, to the statement that his grandmother was proud and didn't like discussing medication being the reasoning for why he doesn't know what medicines she took. Response counsel? Uh, yes, Your Honor. As the grandson of Miss Agatha Lee and someone who was living with Miss Agatha Lee during this time, Mr. Rogers knows whether or not her grandmother likes to discuss certain topics with them. It's not asking to jump inside the mindset of Miss Agatha Lee at all. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. We have no problem with Mr. Rogers saying that his grandmother didn't discuss his her medication with him, but going that further step, saying that she didn't like to and giving a reason as to why she didn't like to, that's too far. That's the speculation I'm objecting to. Your Honor, I think we lost you there for a minute. Sorry, I'll overrule it. I think he's keeping it to his personal experience. Yes, Your Honor. Now, when you said you moved in, your grandmother, she accepted you with open arms. What was it like after that first day back together? It felt like I had family again. Uh, the two of us played backgammon together. We watched her daytime stories together. We even cooked together from time to time. How was your relationship with her housekeeper, Miss Drew Mars? Not so great. I remember on my 31st birthday, Mars asked when I planned on moving out. And it wasn't the first time that Mars had asked me that, and it certainly wasn't the last time either. Now, I'd like to flash forward to August 14th. Can you walk us through how that day began? Certainly. Um, it began like most others. I got up, went for a run, and when I got back, I brought Nana her breakfast. I was telling her about this tech startup in town that I thought would be a great investment, but you know, Nana wasn't as certain and she said she wasn't interested, didn't want to, and was going to pass. Did you two talk about anything else? Right after turning down the investment idea, she looked me in the eyes and, and she said she loved me, that, that she was proud of me. And I remember tears were welling up in my eyes and, and her eyes. And that's when she said she planned on leaving her estate to me. Did that surprise you? Of course. She had told me a while back that she planned on leaving everything to Mars. I, I was stunned that she changed her mind. Now, have you seen the original will that left everything to the defendant, Drew Mars? I, I actually haven't. She mentioned it in a letter a while back, but I had never seen it before then. Now, during this meeting with your grandmother, did she change her will? No, she uh, called her attorney and, and said she was going to schedule a meeting on Friday to, to change it officially. Now, you said that the defendant, Drew Mars, originally was the inheritor of her estate. Do you know if your grandmother told the defendant about those changes? Nana didn't have to. When we left the study, Mars was waiting right outside the room. She was breathing shallowly, her face was red, and she was clenching her fists like this. Well, did the defendant say anything to you? She started walking Nana down the hall to take her to her appointment, and she turned back at me and looked me dead in the eyes and just mouthed, no way. Well, after you heard, or you uh, watched Miss Mars uh, mouth, no way. What'd you do next? Well, Nana had to go to a, a lunch appointment that day. And so I decided to take a shower and get dressed. Then I, I called Nana's favorite florist in town and, and had a bouquet of her favorite flowers delivered. Some sunflowers and pink roses. Around what time did your grandmother return? Mid-afternoon. Nana and I watched one of those old Alex Grace movies Alex Grace was Nana's favorite actor. And, uh, and then we had an early dinner. When you guys were eating dinner, where was the defendant? Well, Mars said that uh, she was going to call it a night after dropping off the dinner at about six o'clock. And around what time did you go to sleep? About 9.30 that night. 
I went downstairs for a little bit on my way to bed and, and on my way back up, I actually saw Drew Mars. Now, Mr. Rogers, if I were to show you a diagram of the house that y'all lived at, would you recognize it? I'm sure I would. I'll let the record reflect. I'm screen sharing what's already been entered into evidence as exhibit five. Uh, Mr. Rogers, what have I just showed you? This looks like it's the floor plan of, of Nana's estate where we were living when she passed away. Now, where did you see the defendant later that night when you went upstairs to go to bed? Well, I was standing here at the bottom of the first floor steps. And then I saw Drew Mars standing outside of Mars's bedroom. Now, what was the defendant doing when you saw her outside of her bedroom? It looked like Drew Mars was walking towards Nana's room and Mars had her, her hand clasped and, and raised kind of like this, like, like she was holding something almost. Objection, Your Honor. Um, lack of foundation that she was holding something in her hand. Response, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. We, uh, Mr. Rogers has just laid the foundation that he was walking with his hand up and his hand clasped and that it looked like they were holding something. The foundation was laid in Mr. Rogers' answer. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, the witness testified that he saw her hand raised and her fingers clenched, but he hasn't testified that he saw something in her hand. Now, to be clear, Your Honor, this witness is alleging that Drew Mars at this moment was bringing the pills to switch the pills, um, switch, excuse me, Agatha Lee's pills. For him to say that it looked like she was holding something, we haven't heard any foundation of that because all he was able to see is what her hand was doing, not whether or not there was something in her hand. Since this is such a critical part of today's case, Your Honor, that foundation is really important if this witness is going to be allowed to make that statement. I remember the witness saying his her hand was curled like she was holding something. I'll allow that in. You're free to cross-examine on whether he actually saw something in her hand or not. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Rogers, did you ever see your grandmother again? Um, not alive, no. Uh, Mars came in my room the next morning and, and said Nana wasn't breathing. What did you do after being told that? I, I did what I think anyone would do. I, I called the police, but all they did was, was drag their feet. Did you do anything when you realized the police were just dragging their feet? I decided to hire that same investigator who found Nana a couple of weeks before to get to, them, get to the bottom of what happened. I just lost the only family I had left. I, I had to know what happened. I, I just wanted closure. And were you ever able to figure out what did happen to your grandmother? Yeah. It, it turns out she had an allergic reaction to some sort of medication. Did you know that your grandmother had any allergies? I found out in August. Well, did the defendant, Drew Mars, know about your grandmother's allergy? She did, yes. Mars told me that she did. And thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I have no further questions. Thank you, counsel. Cross-examination. Uh, hi, Mr. Rogers. Before I start, can you see and hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. I, I can. Thank you. Now, sir, I want to start by picking up right where you just left off. You told us that the police were dragging their feet, so you hired investigator Bond. Do I have that right? That's right. Now, sir, I want to be clear about what happened on that morning. On that morning, you picked up the phone and you called the police. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. And you remember you were deposed about this in particular, right? Of course. The lawyers asked you, well, what did you do next after calling the police, right? That's right. You told them you called a private investigator. Do I have that right, sir? That's correct. Yes. To be clear, that private investigator showed up at your house before the police had even arrived. Is that right? You're exactly right. I, I called the police and 
they said it sounded fine and and that they would get to it when they could get to it and send somebody out whenever they could that that just wasn't good enough for me so i i called the investigator so the police showed up at your house 30 minutes after you called right that's right that investigator showed up at your house 25 minutes after you called do i have that right well, that's right bond said that they were working on another case but would get over as soon as they could mr rogers i want to talk about your relationship with your grandmother now on direct examination you told us you visited your grandmother in 2018 is that right that's right that's when i moved back in and before that you hadn't seen her in years right no no ma'am i i was in a rough rough spot right the last time you had seen her that was back in 2011 do i have that right yes ma'am so on direct you told us you didn't talk much to be clear from 2011 to 2018 you never visited your grandmother's home, right? You're right, I didn't. From 2011 to 2018, you never wrote your grandmother any emails, right? I, I, I didn't. I can't tell you how many times that I'd, I'd pulled up my email to send her a message, but every, every time I could just picture my mom's face and, and I just couldn't do it. So from 2011 to 2018, you called your grandmother one time. Is that right? That's right. Mr. Rogers, I want to talk about what changed. Something you didn't mention on direct examination is that you actually got a letter from your grandmother in February of 2018. Is that right? That's right. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Becker, could you put exhibit 10 on the screen for us? Sir, this is that letter? Yes, it appears to be. It looks just like the last time you saw it, right? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time, a defense offers Exhibit 10 into evidence. Any objection, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. The plaintiff would object to hearsay. Response? Yes, Your Honor. The content of this letter is actually already on the record. We both parties have agreed that it's true. In this letter, Agatha Lee writes to Stevie Rogers to say that she's taking Stevie out of her will and putting Drew Mars into the will. Now that set of facts, Your Honor, we've already stipulated to. Everyone here agrees. So we're not using this letter for the truth of the matter, but rather for the effect it had on Stevie Rogers. When realizing he was going to lose this money, that's when he showed up at his grandmother's for the first time in years. Counsel, are there any statements you believe are being used for the truth in this letter? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In fact, there's only one paragraph in this document that does discuss the will and the changing of the will at all. And if opposing counsel would like to redact everything but what I believe is paragraph four, the plaintiff would be happy with that. However, opposing counsel could also ask the same questions without bringing this document in unless they were going to use other parts of this document that haven't been agreed to for its truth value. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. And we're not using any sections of the letter, including the one outside of that paragraph that opposing counsel just mentioned, for their truth value. We're using this letter, Agatha Lee describing she was upset, she wanted to change her will, to explain Stevie Rogers' actions. After receiving this letter, he showed up at his grandmother's house for the first time in years, as we are in this case alleging that Stevie Rogers framed Drew Mars in this case. It's important for the jury to hear what potential motive he had in going back to her house. I'll overrule the objection. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, you received this letter from your grandmother in February of 2018. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Your grandmother tells you that you've been using her as your private ATM, right? That's right. She says she doesn't even remember the last time you called without asking for money. Is that right? That's right. She's exactly right. I was embarrassed of the person that I was. She tells you she's taking you out of her will and putting Drew Mars into it. Is that right? That's that's what she says in the letter, yes. Sir, this letter, it made you upset, didn't it? It hurt. It hurt to know how far the two of us had fallen apart. Mr. Rogers, I want to be clear about the, the timeline here. Uh, Mr. Becker, could we get that timeline on the screen, please? Sir, you didn't go visit your grandmother in February after she wrote you this letter, did you? No, no, ma'am, I, I didn't. You didn't go visit her in April or in May, right? No, I, I went to visit her in July of 2018. Well, sir, before that, 
your trust fund ran out. Is that right? It did. It was because of my own irresponsibility. For the past 10 years, you had been living off of this trust fund. Is that right? That's right. Yes, ma'am. It started with $2 million in it, right? It did. Sir, like you said, you spent that money traveling, right? That's right. You didn't work a job in that 10 year period? No, ma'am, not at all. But in June of 2018, that trust fund ran out of money. Is that right? That's right. I spent the last little bit I had on checking myself into the rehab clinic. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to show up to my grandmother's house again, I was, I was right. And I was the same person that, that she remembered, a person she'd be proud of. Sir, I understand you want to explain, and in just a second, your attorney can come back up here and ask you some more questions. But directing you back to my question, your trust fund ran out in June of 2018. Is that right? That's right. I spent the last bit I had on, on the rehab. Sir, then you showed up at your grandmother's house on July 4th, right? I did. Yeah, I, I felt good about the progress that I'd made and thought I was strong enough to see her again. One month after your trust fund ran out, that's when you started watching movies with your grandmother again. Is that right? That's right. It was like, like before. Sir, I want to go ahead and talk about the day before your grandmother died. Now, sir, on that day, August 14th, you knew your grandmother was allergic to chloroandramine, right? I did. Morris had told me previously. You knew that chloroandramine was available over the counter at any pharmacy? I did, yes. And sir, you were actually home that entire day. Is that right? That's right. That's when I was ordering the bouquet of flowers for Nana or when she got home from her appointment. Well, sir, I want to talk about that appointment. When that happened, your grandmother left the house, right? She did, yes. Drew Mars left the house, right? That's right. So you were actually home alone during that time. Do I have that right? That's right, I was. Mr. Rogers, I wanna talk about why you're here today. And today you're suing under the Slayer statute. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Rogers, you know that the Slayer statute says that a person can't inherit money from someone who they've killed. Do I have that uh, right? Objection, Your Honor. At this point, uh, opposing counsel's line of questioning is forcing Mr. Rogers to come to legal opinions and legal conclusions. Response, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. If I may proffer, it's our theory that Mr. Rogers knew about the Slayer statute long before this case began. He knew that he could frame Drew Mars for committing this crime and in doing so, get the inheritance money. That's what this line of questioning is going to prove, Your Honor. May I respond on this grounds? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, regardless of whether or not opposing counsel believes that to be true, this line of questioning is calling for Mr. Rogers to present legal conclusions to the jury as fact. And therefore, these questions are asking for a legal opinion, uh, one that which Mr. Rogers is not qualified to give to the jury. May I respond, Your Honor? One more. Mr. Rogers is suing under this Slayer statute. I'm asking whether or not he understands what that means. If he doesn't, he's free to say so. But based on our deposition, we have a good faith basis to believe that Mr. Rogers understands exactly what's going on in today's proceeding and knew that long before he ever spoke with his attorneys. That's what I'm demonstrating to the jury, Your Honor. If he doesn't understand or doesn't know anything I'm asking, the jury should hear him say that. I'll allow it to the extent that you ask him what his understanding of the law is, but I want you to be clear in your questioning that you're not asking him to interpret it or explain it to a jury. Absolutely, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Rogers, like you just told us, you're suing here today under the Slayer statute. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Your understanding of the Slayer statute is that a person can't get money, inherit money from someone who they've killed. Is that right? That's, that's my understanding. Yes. Sir, your understanding of what happens here today is that if you win, your grandmother's inheritance money won't stay with Drew Mars, right? I, I assume so. You know that the money it's not going to the state of midlands right I, I don't i don't believe so no sir you know that if you win here today you're going to get your grandmother's inheritance right i guess but frankly i i don't care i don't i don't care about the money i i i just 
I, I just want another day with my Nana back. That, that, that's all. Mr. Rogers, I understand that you're saying you don't care, but I'm asking you about what you know. You know that if you win here today, you're getting your grandmother's inheritance money, right? That, that, that's right, but it, it doesn't make up for all the time that, that we lost together. Well, you know that includes her house, right? That's right. That includes her famous book, right? It does, yes. That includes almost $20 million in cash. That's right, but the time that we were gonna have together that, ma'am, that's priceless. Mr. Becker, could we get that timeline back on the screen? Sir, you'd agree with me that you filed this lawsuit on August 20th, is that right? That's right, yes ma'am. This lawsuit alleging that Drew Mars poisoned your grandmother with chloroandramine, that's what you filed on August 20th, right? I did. Sir, between the 15th when your grandmother died and the 20th, you never saw a toxicology report, did you? No, I had not. Between the 15th and the 20th, you never saw an autopsy for your grandmother, did you? No, ma'am. Between the 15th and the 20th, when you claimed Drew Mars poisoned your grandmother, no one had told you an official cause of death. Is that right? No, ma'am. All I knew was that on the day of August 14th, Nana was her usual self, happy, full of life, and she didn't wake up the next day. I'm not a medical expert, I'm not a doctor, but it, it didn't seem like people just did that. That just happened. Sir, I understand you think that that doesn't just happen, but I wanna be clear. On the 20th, you didn't say, well, something's wrong here, we need to look into this, right? No, I had done that on August 15th when, when, when Nana had died. Right, on the 20th, you said Drew Mars poisoned my grandmother using chloroandramine. Is that right? That's right. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I have nothing further at this time. Any redirect, counsel? Uh, no redirect, Your Honor. I just ask that uh, my witness be excused. The witness is excused. All right, do we know what time all loss is for this trial? I believe it's 6.10. Okay. Um, do we want to take a five-minute break? I think if we keep it to five minutes, I'd be happy with the, or that'd be good with the plaintiff. That's fine with us as well, Your Honor. All right, we can take a five minute break. Um, judges, remember the videos being broadcast on YouTube throughout. See you all in five minutes.
judges, when you return, if you could please um, unmute your video or send me a message through the chat, just so I know that all of you are here before I close the breakout room. Okay, it looks like we're just waiting for he is here. That means all of you are here. I'm going to be closing the breakout room. You guys can remute your videos. Thank you. All right, do we have all of our competitors back as well? Your Honor, I think defense is all back. Um, I did just want to note, I think we are getting pretty close to all loss. Um, I don't know if it's objections or what's taking so long, but um, just so everyone's aware, we're not taking too long in the second half. All right, we'll keep it moving. Um, does defense want to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, defense calls Drew Mars to the stand. And Your Honor, I just want to make sure that the Plaintiff attorney is, is ready to go. It looks like we still have one attorney still in the breakout room. Okay. All right. Okay, Judge Hainer Slattery, you are ready to proceed. All right, you can go ahead. Hi, Ms. Mars, before I begin, can you hear and see me all right? Uh, yes, ma'am, I can. Ma'am, could you start by introducing yourself to the court? Sure. Um... Hello, uh, my name is Drew Mars. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I was born in New Zealand. I'm the oldest of three siblings. Uh, they're all still back at home. I moved to America when I was 20 um, to study nursing. Ma'am, do you know somebody named Agatha Lee? I do. I was Agatha's caretaker. I started working for her when I was a junior in college. I worked for her for over 10 years. What were your responsibilities in that job? Mostly, I was responsible for checking her health, but really I did anything that she needed. Cooking, cleaning, that sort of thing. I lived with Agatha full time. Could you tell us about your relationship with Agatha, Miss Lee? Agatha felt more like family than a patient. I didn't have any family in America, but Agatha always took care of me. I really loved her. Well, Ma'am, do you have any idea if Agatha Lee had any other family? Only her grandson, Stevie. Uh, Agatha would call Stevie her perfect grandchild. Stevie was always calling and visiting. Um, but in 28 to 2008, um, things changed after Stevie's mom died in a car crash. What do you mean, Miss Mars? What changed? Stevie cop stopped visiting. I never heard him call Agatha or, or reach out. It, it was awful to watch. Agatha had just lost her daughter and then she lost contact with her only grandchild. Ms. Mars, I do want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about Agatha Lee's will. Have you ever seen her will before? Yes, ma'am. I have seen two different versions of it. Let's start with that first version. What was that? That was in 2008. After Stevie's mother died, um, 
Agatha changed her will to, to leave everything to Stevie. So what was the second version of the will that you saw? Agatha changed her will in, in 2018. She decided to leave everything to me. Well, Ms. Mars, how did you react when you found that out? It was incredibly generous. I, I honestly, I, I couldn't believe it when, when she told me. Well, Ms. Mars, do you have any idea if Stevie Rogers knew that he had been taken out of Agatha's will? Yes. Agatha showed me a letter that she sent Stevie in February of 2018, letting him know that he was being taken out of the will. And I want to go ahead and fast forward to the day of August 14th. Mr. Brecker, could we get that timeline back on the screen? And I want to go ahead and focus in on that day of Agatha's death, the 14th and 15th. So ma'am, how did that day start out for you? It was pretty normal. Um, I woke up, started cleaning the house. I usually make Agatha tea in the morning. So I took her one to her study at 11.30. I heard her and Stevie in there together. Well, did you hear any part of their conversation? I heard Stevie demand Agatha put him back in the will. Agatha refused, though. She said that she wouldn't give Stevie a penny. She Objection, said that Your Honor, to hearsay as to the statements from Miss Agatha Lee. Response? Yes, Your Honor. We're offering these statements for the effect they had on the listener. It's our contention in today's case that after hearing these statements, Stevie Rogers decided that there was no other option for him to get the will money. So he went ahead and killed Agatha Lee and framed, uh, framed Stevie Rogers, excuse me, We're offering these statements, not for their truth. I mean, in truth, we don't know what Agatha Lee would have done with her will, but the effect they had on Stevie, once Stevie believed there was no way he could get back in the will, he took the events later on in this case. May I be heard on those counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, opposing counsel is quite clearly using the fact that Agatha Lee told Stevie Rogers no to changing the will as, tr as truth. They even said so throughout their entire case in chief and throughout their opening statement that Agatha Lee refused to change the will. They're clearly using this information to show the truth. And furthermore, as to the effect on the listener, Miss Mars has no way of knowing how this affected Stevie Rogers and certainly can't testify to how that affected him in the way that Miss Meta described. May I respond, Your Honor? Is, is your opposing counsel correct in that you are arguing this is true throughout your case? Your Honor, the truth is we don't know what whether or not Agatha Lee would have eventually put Stevie Rogers back in her will. Our argument is that Stevie Rogers believed that to be true, that he thought there was no chance he could get back in the will. Just as earlier in today's trial, uh, plaintiff's counsel offered a different version of this conversation to suggest a motive for Drew Mars, that effect it had on Drew Mars. We're offering this testimony, a different version, Miss Mars's recollection of this conversation for that same exact purpose, Your Honor. I'll overrule it. Yes, Your Honor. So, Ms. Mars, you were telling us what you heard between Stevie Rogers and Agatha Lee on that morning. Could you finish? Stevie demanded that Agatha put, put him back in the will, but Agatha stood her ground and, and she refused. She said that she wanted Stevie to learn to, to stand on his own two feet. Well, ma'am, what happened next? They came out of the study. Agatha asked me to get her car because she had a lunch meeting. Ma'am, did Stevie Rogers say anything to you? After Agatha left, Stevie glared at me and he said, don't count your millions just yet. Well, Ma'am, what happened next? I took Agatha to lunch um, at noon, and then I headed to the pharmacy to pick up some things for her um, while she was at lunch. Do you remember what it is you bought at the pharmacy on that day? No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I have to go to the pharmacy a lot for Agatha, but I don't remember what I bought that day, I'm sorry. So ma'am, what did you do after leaving the pharmacy? I picked up Agatha from her lunch meeting and we went home. We got back at two. Ma'am, when you left for your lunch meeting at 12, do you know if anyone was at the house? It was just Stevie when we left. 
Well, what about when you got back to the house at two? Was anyone at the house then? Again, uh, it was just Stevie. Ma'am, do you have any idea if Stevie Rogers knew about Agatha's chloroandramine allergy? Yes, ma'am. Stevie knew. I, I told Stevie when he first moved in. It's important to make sure that anyone living with a patient is aware of any specific health needs they have. I told Stevie that chloroandramine in, in any small amount would be really dangerous for Agatha, so we had to be extremely careful. So ma'am, what happened after you and Agatha got back to the house on that day? I cleaned up a little. I, I made dinner for Agatha and Stevie and gave it to them at 6 p.m. I went to my room a little while later and I was asleep by 9.30. Now, Ms. Mars, I know this is difficult, but I do have to ask you about what happened the next morning. Could you tell us what went on when you woke up? I mean, at first I, I didn't realize anything was wrong. I woke up around seven and, and did some chores, but around 8.30, uh, Agatha still wasn't up. So I, I took her a coffee to her room. What did you see? Um, Agatha was, was still in her bed, but she wasn't moving. I, I tried to wake her up, but, but she didn't have a pulse. I, I felt like I, I couldn't breathe. Ma'am, what did you do next? I, I ran to Stevie's room to get help. I, he was the only other person in the house. I, I didn't know who else to go to. Well, what did Stevie do? Well, I, I keep telling Stevie that, that his grandmother needed help, that, that we needed to call him an, or an ambulance, but Stevie just stared at me. He said nothing, and then he picked up the phone and he called the police. He, he told them that I had murdered his grandmother. Ma'am, when Stevie Rogers told the police that you had murdered Agatha, had he been to see Agatha's body yet? No, no, he hadn't. Mr. Becker, you can take the timeline down, thank you. So ma'am, what did Stevie do? He, he just jumped out of bed and he called the police. He didn't act surprised or, or cry. He didn't even go check on Agatha. Thank you, ma'am. I have nothing further for Ms. Mars at this time. All right, thank you, counsel. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Mars, I'd like to spend a minute talking about Agatha Lee's will. Sure. Uh, to be clear, you were originally going to get everything in Agatha Lee's estate, right? Yes, sir. Agatha changed her will in 2018 to leave everything to me. And you were here today when Mr. Stevie Rogers was testifying? Yes, sir, I was. And so you were there when Mr. Rogers talked about a conversation that he had with Agatha Lee about this will, right? Yes, sir, I was. And so you were in court here today when Mr. Rogers told us that Agatha Lee decided that she was, in fact, going to change her will and leave everything to him. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. I heard Stevie say that, but I don't quite understand because that's not how the conversation happened. I heard Agatha refuse to take Stevie out of, to put Stevie back in the will, and then they left. Well, let's talk a little bit about that conversation because you're right. You do also mention a conversation happening at the same time between Mr. Rogers and Agatha Lee, right? Yes, sir. I heard Stevie ask Agatha to, to put him back in the will. But I heard Agatha say no, that, that she wasn't going to. To be clear, Miss Mars, you weren't in this room, were you? No, sir, I wasn't. I, I was going to take a tea in for Agatha. In fact, you were several feet away from that room, weren't you? Yes, sir. I was right outside the door when, when they came out. That's right. But to be clear for the members of the jury, when you overheard this conversation, that door was closed. Yes, sir, it was. They were inside the study. And from what you were able to hear, it sounded to you at least like Miss Agatha Lee was whispering this to Stevie Rogers. Yes, sir. It sounded like they were talking, 
I heard Stevie ask Agatha to put him back in the will, but I heard Agatha say no. But it's your testimony today that as a result of that conversation, Agatha Lee told Stevie Rogers that she wasn't going to change her will at all. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. I heard well, Agatha say that she wanted Stevie to learn to, to stand on his own two feet, that, that she had over-supported him when, when he was little. Well, let's talk about something that happened right after you overheard that conversation. You took Miss Agatha Lee to lunch, right? Yes, sir, I did. And on your way to lunch, you noticed that Miss Agatha Lee took a phone call. Yes, sir. That phone call was with someone named Kirby. Yes, sir, it was. And you're familiar with the personal attorney of Miss Agatha Lee, right? Yes, sir. I believe that's Kirby. That's right. It's Kirby Doolittle. Isn't that yes, right, Miss Mars? Right. Okay. Yes, sir. So you would agree with me also that Kirby Doolittle, that was the attorney that was responsible for, for changing the will to you in the first place. Isn't that right? I really don't know, sir. I'm sorry. I know that she was Agatha's personal lawyer. I'm not sure about the logistics. I I'm sorry. Well, Miss Mars, you were there when the will was signed over, weren't you? Y yes, sir, I was. Now let's talk about what you did right after you dropped Miss Agatha Lee off at lunch. You went straight to a pharmacy, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. I have to go to the pharmacy a couple of times a week to pick up things for Agatha. And to be clear, you pick things up for Agatha Lee because you're her caretaker. Yes, sir. I'm responsible for her health care and, and doing anything she needs around the house. And part of that job includes dealing with her medication. Yes, sir. That's, that's part of my role as her caretaker. Which means that you're also familiar with the drug known as chloroandrum. Yes, sir. That was the drug that Agatha was deathly allergic to. We made sure that we never had it in the house so that she couldn't mistake it for something else and accidentally take it. Well, let's talk about what she could have mistaken it for. Miss Mars, you're familiar with the fact that that pill looks very similar to a medication Miss Lee takes on a daily basis. Yes, sir. It's identical to Winterin. That's, that's her arthritis medication. And that's why it's so dangerous to have chlororangamine in the house be, because they're so identical. And, and that's why I always made sure that anyone who went to the house knew that they couldn't bring chlororangamine in. It was too dangerous. Now, this isn't the first time that Miss Agatha Lee has ingested chlorandramine, is it? No, sir. When I started working for her in 2008, it was after she had a heart attack uh, after taking chlorandramine. That's right. It, it was a pretty serious occurrence, wasn't it? But yes, sir. That's, that's what I was told. And you're also familiar with how much chlorandramine Miss Lee took to have that heart attack, isn't that right? Yes, sir. She took one pill and that was 250 milligrams. Yes, sir. That's what her caretaker at the time told me. Now, you're also familiar with how much chloro... Sorry, could... counsel? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear the objection. Oh, excuse me. I was objecting to hearsay that the knowledge that opposing counsel is eliciting that in this past incident, Agatha Lee took one 250 milligram pill of chloroandramine this witness just testified she only knows that because it was told to her. That's the hearsay I'm objecting to. Response? Yes, Your Honor. We're not using this information for the truth of the matter asserted. We don't care exactly how many milligrams of chlorandramine she took. Rather, that the defendant, Drew Mars, uh, was aware or made aware of a certain number, and that in today's case, that number was twice as high as what was used to have her first heart attack. Anything further, counsel? Your Honor, I would argue they certainly are using this fact for the truth of the matter, that one pill wasn't enough. That's why it was two pills in the dosage. That is the truth of the matter, Your Honor, that one pill was enough to give her a heart attack. Excuse me. It was enough to give her a heart attack, but not to kill her. Excuse me. The objection's overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Now, to be clear, Ms. Mars, on August 14th, Agatha Lee ingested two pills, which was 500 milligrams of chloroandramine. Yes, sir, that's, that's what the police told me, and they said that's what killed her. Now, they found, the police, they found chloroandramine inside the house, didn't they? Yes, sir. Specifically, they found chloroandramine in your room. Yes, sir. The, the, the police told me that they found a bag in my closet, but 
I have never seen that bag before. I, I had never touched it. I, I don't know how it got in my room. The, the only people who live in the house are me, Agatha, and Stevie. Miss Mars, you mentioned that you've never touched this bag, but isn't it true that you had fingerprints on this bag? Yes, sir. That, that's what the police told me. I, I wish I could tell you that I remember accidentally touching the bag, but I don't know how my fingerprint got on that bag. Now, that's not the only place uh, regarding Agatha Lee's medication that they found your fingerprints, is it? I'm not sure what you mean, sorry. Well, you would agree with me that the police also found your fingerprints on some of Miss Lee's medication. Y yes, sir. I handle her medication weekly. That's what I use to put in her pill organizer. Well, they only found fingerprints on two pills. Isn't that right? That's what the police told me. Yes, sir. And those two pills were on two Winterin pills. Yes, sir. Winterin is her insulin med medication. And those two Winterin pills are also the same two pills that look exactly like chloroandramine. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Chloroandramine looks identical to Winterin. That's why it was so dangerous to have it in the house around Agatha. Now, Miss Mars, you ended up lying to quite a few people after her death, didn't you? I'm not sure what you mean. I I'm sorry, sir. Well, you were at the will reading for Agatha Lee. Yes, sir, I was. And so you were there when they announced that you would be inheriting her entire estate? Yes, sir. I, I was there when they announced the will. Miss Mars, you told everyone there that you were shocked. Yes, sir. I, I knew that I was going to inherit the will money. I, I was terrified. <laughs> For days, Stevie had been telling people that I had murdered his grandfather, his, his, his grandmother, and... I was terrified that people would believe him, and that's exactly what happened. Miss Mars, to be clear, you told them that you had no idea that you were getting everything. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have. I, I was just so scared at the time. So you lied then, didn't you? Yes, sir. I, I knew that I was getting the will money. I was just terrified about how it would look that her caretaker was getting her will. Nothing further at this time, Your Honor. No redirect, Your Honor. All right, the witness is excused. And defense, you can call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor, defense calls Ryan Cabrera to the stand. And before we begin, Your Honor, we'd just like to note for the court that we're going to be using the timeline demonstrative with previous testimony redacted in accordance with 615. Sounds good. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm going to be asking you some questions today. Before I begin, can you see and hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Could you begin by introducing yourself to the members of the jury? Hi, um, I'm Ryan Cabrera. And what do you do for a living, Ms. Cabrera? I'm an author. I write biographies, mostly. How'd you become an author? Slowly. I started writing young adult fiction, but... I don't relate much to children. Now, once I found my knack for biography, my career really took off from there. I've been working in the field for around 10 years now. Could you tell us what your connection to today's case is? Agatha was as a good friend of mine. Back in 2018, I decided that I wanted to write, write a biography about her. So I reached out and she was interested and we began meeting together. We eventually became quite close. I want to talk about your relationship with Agatha Lee. How long did you two know each other? We were friends for about six months. And about how often did you used to see each other back when you were writing that biography? Pretty frequently. Um, we used to play backgammon and we would go on these long walks and grab lunch together, things like that. Ma'am, I want to talk about Agatha Lee's estate. You said the two of you were close. Did she ever happen to talk about her will? Sure, Agatha had, had mentioned it. Uh, we talked a lot about what she'd achieved in her life and, and what she wanted her legacy to be. You know, what would become of her work and her estate, uh, things like that. 
Did she ever show you the will she filed in 2018? Yes, yes, she did. Um, earlier in the year, Agatha had decided to change her will uh, and she talked to me about it. Miss Manta, can we get exhibit nine on the screen? Ms. Cabrera, what is this? Uh, this is that um, 2018 will. Is it a, a fair and accurate copy of that will? Yes, um, that looks like it to me. Your Honor, we offer exhibit nine into evidence. Any objection, counsel? All right, it's admitted. Ms. Cabrera, what were the terms of this 2018 will? Um, well, as you can see, um, it says that she would leave her entire estate to Drew Mars. And does she say anything specifically about her grandson, Stevie Rogers, in that will? Yes. Um, it says, I specifically intend to exclude my grandchild, Stevie Rogers, from receiving any benefit from my estate or under this will. How long before Agatha Lee died did she file this will? Um, it must have been six months before she died. So Ms. Cabrera, in the six months between filing this will and her passing, did Agatha Lee ever talk to you about wanting to put Stevie Rogers back in the will? No, um, she never said that. We've heard today a little bit about how they got closer after moving back in in July of 2018, even after that happened. Did Agatha Lee ever in any way express interest in giving Stevie Rogers her estate? No. All right, ma'am, I wanna focus in now on August 14th, the day that Agatha Lee died. Did you happen to see her that day? Yes, I did. Um, we went out for lunch together that day. I was finishing up the first draft of my biography and I wanted to get some edits from Agatha. How was she acting when you two went out to lunch that day? She was less talkative than normal. She kept changing the subject and she was generally quite quiet. Did you ask her what was wrong? I did and I asked if she was doing all right. How did she respond? Well, um, she said, Stevie asked me for something this morning. I had to say no. Objection. I hope you're saying. May I respond, Your Honor? You may. Now, this actually falls under an exception to hearsay, Rule 8033. Now, while 8033 is generally used for statements of someone's mental condition, the rule itself actually contains a specific provision at the very end which allows for this statement. It allows for statements of memory or belief to be used to prove the matter remembered or believed if that statement relates to the terms of a will. Now, that's exactly what the statement is, Your Honor. Ms. Lee is remembering something about the terms of her will. Your Honor, if I may. You may. There's been no foundation laid that this statement from Agatha Lee is in any way in regards to her will. The statement has Ms. Cabrera stated it was that Stevie had asked Agatha for something and she said no. We have no context that Ms. Cabrera would be able to testify to that this is in regards to the validity of a will. Response, Your Honor. Can you lay that, can you lay that foundation? Well, Your Honor, not on this witness, but may I, may I explain? You may. Now, under Rule 104, when the admissibility of a piece of evidence is dependent on an external fact, the statement itself need not serve as the foundation for that, but rather we have to look to the totality of the circumstances surrounding the proffering of that statement. In this case, Your Honor, all of the circumstances surrounding this statement point to it being about a will, and the standard to do so is just a preponderance of the evidence to run. And I'd be happy to explain how the, stand, how the circumstances meet that standard. Well, opposing counsel, do you have any further response? Yes, Your Honor. I do not believe they've met the pre uh, preponderance of the evidence thing. This comment could be in regards to a number of things. We do not know what specifically the conversation that Ms. Cabrera was being told about is in regards to, as there is no foundation that Agatha Lee provided information to Ms. Cabrera that it was in regards to a will or if it was in regards to anything else. The objection's overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Cabrera, could you remind us what it was that Agatha Lee told you when you asked her, her what was wrong? Yes, of course. Um, she said, Stevie asked me for something this morning. I had to say no. I hope I made the right decision. And what time was it that 
Agatha Lee told you that Stevie had asked her for something and that she had to say no? Um, it was uh, during lunchtime, so around 1 p.m. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, I have nothing further. Thank you, counsel. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Cabrera, I have a few questions in regards to your testimony. All right. Now, you mentioned the conversation you had with Agatha at your last meeting. To be clear, that was on Tuesday, August 14th, correct? Yes, correct. And that was during the lunch that we had on August 14th. And as you said in your direct testimony, Agatha seemed different during this meeting, correct? Yes, um, Agatha was acting much less talkative than normal. You know, she was very quiet and, and she kept shifting from subject to subject. And you said that she stated she was upset over this conversation with Stevie, correct? Yes, exactly. Now, I want to be very clear, Ms. Cabrera, you don't know what that conversation was in regards to. No, I'm not sure. All I know is that um, she said that Stevie had asked her for something and she had to say no. That's right. You don't know what Stevie had asked her? No, no, I, I can't be sure. And you don't know when that conversation took place? No, I I'm not exactly sure. It could have been the day before? It's possible. Um, she could was have very been that morning. Back, so I would have thought recent. But the point stands that you could not tell for certain whether that was at one time or another. Uh, not absolutely certain, no. And you also don't know if anyone else was involved in that conversation. Uh, no, I mean, I wasn't there at that conversation. I just heard it from Agatha. Right. Now, you also mentioned in your direct testimony that Agatha showed you a copy of her 2018 will, correct? Yes, and that's what I was just talking about, and the 2018 will that, that she had changed. And that will named Drew Mars as her sole beneficiary? Yes, that's correct. And when she showed you this will, Drew Mars was actually in the room, correct? Yes, yes, that's true. Yet, you attended the will reading of Agatha's will, correct? Yes, yes, I was there. That was about a week after Agatha died. And... Drew claimed to have no knowledge of Agatha's will. Yes, um, that's what she said. And you found that odd? It was surprising. It was a lie? Uh, yes. Now, you also mentioned that Drew was around for many of your interviews with Agatha, correct? Yes, and Drew was around frequently. Um, she was Agatha's nurse. And on one occasion, Drew actually brought Agatha a small purple pill while you were talking. Yes, um, she brought Agatha a little purple pill and, and started explaining it to her. But Agatha took it without question. Yes, um, Agatha trusted Drew very much. Now, after Agatha passed, you spoke with Drew Mars, correct? Yes, um, it wasn't easy to watch. Drew could barely ever talk about Agatha without getting extremely upset. Now, Drew Mars did end up inheriting Agatha's estate as of now, correct? Yes, that's correct. And when Drew Mars called you, she offered to give you anything from Agatha's estate. Yes, and she did offer that. You know, I'm a big fan of Agatha's work and I consider myself a close friend and so I requested a collection of Agatha's unpublished books. That's right. You requested all of her unpublished books, as well as the rest of her book collection. Yes, that's right. Now, you're aware that Agatha's one published book has 65 million copies sold, correct? Yes, and Death in a Bottle was extremely popular. It's what made me love Agatha so much. Now, you would only be able to receive those public, unpublished manuscripts if Drew Mars retains control of the estate, correct? Yes, um, I believe that's how that works, yes. And you're here to test... Calls for a legal conclusion. Response, counsel. Your Honor, the wit that we have a good faith basis that this witness is aware that she would have only received these books if they were to come from Drew Mars. The witness has stated this herself in her own... Uh, 
autobiography chapter, which for the purposes of today's trial is treated as an affidavit for, per the previous judge's rulings. If needed, I can present that to the witness to refresh her memory, but this witness has stated that she is aware that she would have to inherit or take those from Drew Mars. Counsel, why don't you keep your questions phrased as to her understanding of whether she, how she'd get those books, as long as you do that, the objection. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. No. Ms. Cabrera, it's your understanding that you only receive those books if Drew Mars retains control of the estate. Yes, that's what I understand. And you're testifying today for Drew Mars? Yes, um, Drew asked that I come and testify today. Now, I have another thing I want to ask you. That last meeting with Agatha, she mentioned that she had a meeting with her attorney scheduled, correct? Yes, she did. She said it was scheduled for that Friday. That's right, that Friday. That would have been August 17th. Uh, yes, I believe that would have been the 17th. And that appointment was with her attorney? Yes. And she died on the 15th, correct? Yes, um, that's true. Before she could make that meeting? Yes, um, she, she never made it to her meeting. Thank you. No further questions. No any redirect. Counsel, any redirect? No, no. All right, the witness is excused. And I believe we're 18 minutes from all loss, is that right? Something like that, Your Honor, we would be happy to move right into closings. All right, if both attorneys are okay with that, we can go straight into closings. That is fine with the plaintiff, Your Honor. All right, everyone make sure to switch your view back into speaker view for closings, and plaintiff, you may proceed. Members of the jury, don't let the villain win. On August 14th, the villain decided to take the life of a famous author and is now seeking to profit over $20 million as a result. Now, members of the jury, as the plaintiff in today's case, we bear the burden of proof. That means that we had to prove to you by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant, Drew Mars, purposefully or knowingly caused the death of Agatha Lee. And we had to prove that to you today uh, beyond, or by a preponderance of the evidence. Now, I'd like to start and back up and talk about three things that the defense asked you to pay attention to at the beginning of today's trial. The first thing was that we have no hard evidence. Well, members of the jury, what did you hear? We learned that the defendant's fingerprints were found on a bag containing chloroandromine. We learned that the defendant's fingerprints were found on two pills that look exactly like it in Agatha Lee's medical cabinet. We learned today that Agatha, or that the defendant traveled to a pharmacy just hours before Agatha Lee's death. Members of the jury, we provided you hard evidence. The second thing they wanted you to pay attention to was that Drew Mars had no motive. Or that members of the jury, the defendant seeks to gain over $20 million in combined cash assets, continuing sales of her book, and even a multi-million dollar estate that they currently live in. And members of the jury, the defendant stands to gain everything from the death of Miss Agatha Lee. And the last thing they told you to pay attention to was that Stevie Rogers, the plaintiff in today's case, is framing the defendant. But members of the jury, when did you ever hear evidence of Stevie Rogers even inside of the room, of, of Miss Agatha Lee's room? When did you hear evidence of Stevie Rogers ever going to a store and buying chloroandromine? Members of the jury, Mr. Rogers came up here today and told you that the only reason he even was made aware of an allergy was because the defendant told him. So I want to talk about what happened on August 14th, and I think it's important to talk about why. And why August 14th? Well, we know that on August 14th, Miss Agatha Lee and Stevie Rogers had a conversation, a conversation in which Miss Agatha Lee said she would change her will and give everything back to Stevie Rogers. 
Well, that means that the defendant has a bit of a time crunch because as it stood at the point of that conversation, she was still standing to gain everything. And immediately after that conversation, Miss Agatha Lee was on a phone with her personal attorney. Members of the jury, it was at that point that the defendant knew that action needed to be taken quickly. And so what did she do? As soon as she dropped her off at lunch, she traveled to a drugstore. And conveniently, she doesn't remember what she bought that day. But that's when she bought chloroandrome. But we also have to tell you when she decided to switch the pills in her medical cabinet for the chloroandrome. We learned that later that night, Mr. Stevie Rogers saw the defendant walking from his room or her room to Agatha Lee's room. Her hand was facing up and her fingers were clasped as if she was holding something. And that was the chloroandrome. Members of the jury, we noticed that there were, we found that there were fingerprints on winter and pills inside of the medication bottle. And what that means is that the defendant had to put those pills back inside the bottle. And that's because she took the winter and pills out of her pill capsule and decided to replace them with a fatal drug. Now, this is also why they found fingerprints on a bag containing chloroandramine that was not found in Stevie Rogers' room, that was not found in Agatha Lee's room, but rather it was in the closet, the defendant's closet. And the defendant tried to come up here today and tell you that she never touched this bag ever. But we know that that's not true. We know that she lied because we found fingerprints on that bag in her closet on the handle. Now, members of the jury, what else did the defendant do that day? The defendant also acted suspiciously. She asked for the body to be immediately cremated. Why? So that no one would know what happened and so that the villain could go away or get away. Members of the jury, don't let the villain win. Find her liable. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Closing from the defense. May I proceed? You may. Your Honor. Opposing counsel, members of the jury, may it please the court. Drew Mars was set up to be taken down. Members of the jury, you can say a lot of things about Stevie Rogers, but you can't call him impatient. Because this plan of his, that scheme to get his hands on the $20 million fortune that his grandmother specifically excluded him from, that plan, it wasn't finished in 2018 when he poisoned Agatha Lee. It wasn't finished when he set up Drew Mars to make it look like she'd done it or when he filed this lawsuit. No members of the jury, if you want to know what Stevie Rogers' endgame truly is. Well, folks, you're looking at it. Because make no mistake about why we're in court today, this case, this lawsuit, this very trial, we are living through the final stage of Stevie Rogers' sap. And he's gotten pretty far. But there's still one more obstacle he has to overcome before he gets his way, and that's you, members of the jury. Because when the plaintiff Brought a, uh, brought a count under the Slayer statute, they took on a burden to prove their case more likely than not. They have to prove that Drew Mars is solely responsible for the death of Agatha Lee, but the problem for the plaintiff is that the solid evidence that Drew Mars is the person who did that just doesn't exist. And today we showed you why. From the very beginning, she was set up be taken down. Let's talk about the evidence. And I'm going to first talk about the plaintiff's case, what they couldn't show you about Drew Mars, and then I want to talk about our case, what we showed you about Stevie Rogers. Now, the plaintiff's case leaned pretty heavily on this alleged motive. 
to explain why someone's loving caretaker of 10 years would murder them in their sleep with a pill. But if you actually think about that motive that the plaintiff talked so much about, if you think about what evidence they put forward to support it, it completely falls apart. Because they want you to believe that Drew Mars was so worried about being taken out of a will that she was willing to murder, but the only thing they put forward in support of that is this alleged conversation that happened between Stevie Rogers and Agatha Lee. A conversation that is completely uncorroborated by any other evidence, any other witnesses, a conversation that is actually contradicted by not one, but two witnesses. Remember what Drew Mars told us. Stevie Rogers did ask to be put back in that will, but Agatha Lee didn't say yes, she said no. And that was confirmed by what we heard from Ryan Cabrera. Stevie asked me for something this morning. I had to say no. Members of the jury, if that conversation didn't happen exactly the way Stevie Rogers wants you to believe it did, then this case is closed. Because without that conversation, what motive does Drew Mars really have? I mean, she lived with Agatha Lee for 10 years. Nothing happened. Then Stevie Rogers comes home and one month later, Agatha Lee is dead. So let's talk about Stevie Rogers. Let's start from the beginning. And we know what he wanted when he moved in to, with his grandmother in July of 2018. Because no matter how much he tells you that he wanted to reconnect with her or that they had a great relationship, the timing doesn't lie. In February, he learns he's going to be disinherited. In June, his trust fund runs out. And then one month later, lo and behold, he shows up on the doorstep of the grandmother who he hasn't spoken to in seven years. I mean, it's textbook. So we know what he wanted when he moved in, but how did this scheme turn into a setup? Well, that happened on August 14th. And it happened because of that conversation that Drew Mars told us about and that Ryan Cabrera confirmed. Because Agatha Lee said no. Think about the timing of that very important no, members of the jury. The same day that Agatha Lee is murdered is also the day that Stevie Rogers realizes that the only way for him to get that $20 million fortune is through a lawsuit just like this one. And so begins the setup. And both sides agree. Stevie Rogers had access to chloroandramine, access to the pill organizer, was home alone for broad swaths of the day and was fully aware of that allergy. But if you have any doubt that he went ahead and used that access and that knowledge to, to, to set up Drew Mars, all you need to do is look at his behavior the next day. Drew Mars wakes him up, tells him that something is wrong with Agatha, but Stevie Rogers he doesn't act the way a normal, loving grandchild would. He picks up the phone, calls the police, and tells them that his grandmother was murdered. He doesn't even go to check if she's dead, members of the jury. And then things get even more suspicious once the police do arrive, because from the moment they get there, Stevie Rogers is leading them to the evidence he wants them to find demands a toxicology screen adamant that Agatha Lee was poisoned, even though he supposedly has no way of knowing that. But this setup wasn't done on August 15th. Because five days later, when Agatha Lee's body is barely cold, he files this lawsuit. Doesn't wait for the toxicology screen to come back because he knows what it'll show. He doesn't wait for the autopsy because he knows that the cause of death is homicide. And then the evidence does come in. And what do you know? He was right about the murder. He was right about the poison. Members of the jury, either Stevie Rogers based this lawsuit on the luckiest guess in history, or he knew exactly how, when, and why Agatha Lee died from the very beginning. The fact is, before Agatha Lee died, she made a choice. She made a conscious, reasoned decision to leave everything she owned to the person she cared about most in this world. 
And Stevie Rogers doesn't have to respect that choice. That's his right. But it doesn't change the law. And no matter how hard he tries to override his grandmother's last will and testament, no matter how many investigations he funds, how much evidence he plants, how many lawyers he hires, it doesn't change the facts. And the facts are these. Drew Mars had nothing to do with the death of Agatha Lee. She was set up. Don't let Stevie Rogers take her down. Find Drew Mars not liable. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Plaintiff, do you have any rebuttal? Uh, no rebuttal, Your Honor, due to time constraints and all loss. All right. In that case, we're, we are finished with the case. Um,